data bite. Um, first, how many of you have been to Data and Society before? How many of you, this is your first time here? Woohoo! You have arrived at our 100th data bite, which is pretty awesome, right? <laughs> So for those who haven't been to Data and Society before, we are a research institute who's really thinking about the intersection between data-driven technologies and broader social uh, issues. And the uh, talks that we have today are going to be by three of our fellows who are going to give us their take from a variety of different angles. Um, and I'm really, really excited to have them here. I'm also really just excited to celebrate uh, Data and Society's 100th uh, data bite. Part of what makes it really exciting is that we started data bytes before we even really existed as an institution. Um, is there anybody who was at the first data bite? It was Heather Dewey, Hagwin, Ingrid back there, and, and Seth was too, but he's not admitting it. Um, uh, it was Heather Dewey, Hagboard, uh, and Alondra Nelson, and we had the two of them come in as uh, sort of their first introduction to each other to be able to debate and, and argue about different issues related to um, DNA, which is part of what makes our first talk so exciting here today, because we're actually coming back to those topics again. And I don't know if Dan knew that he was being set up that way. Um, so uh, Dan Grushkin um, is uh, one of our fellows with us this, uh, this year. And he's going to open us up with a talk. Do you have a title? Uh, with a, the with a, um, talk around GenSpace. I don't know. What, what's the actual talk title? The uh, DNA Revolution. The DNA Revolution. Sweet. All right. Um, so just as a, a sense, we're going to have three talks um, from f our fellows, and then we're going to um, turn it into some conversation and Q&A uh, before we go into a Whiskey Wednesday afterwards. Turn it over to Dan. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so I, I didn't know this, but Heather is in my slides, so that's convenient. Um, all right, let me tell you quickly about who I am. I um, started as a journalist writing about science and biotechnology, and then ended up starting what is called GenSpace, which is the world's first community biology lab. So way back when, eight years ago, some of you have heard the story, I apologize. Uh, way back uh, eight years ago, um, as a journalist, I was reporting on all these uh, fantastic discoveries in biotechnology and found myself deeply jealous of the scientists who were doing these experiments because I wanted to see how it actually worked myself. I wanted to try the science myself. And as someone with a degree in English literature, um, that meant I was going nowhere near their labs. Uh, so I had a decision. Either I could go back and start undergraduate from day one, uh, and then go to graduate school, and then go and get a PhD, and then uh, you know get a grant and start my own lab, uh, and then t you know, so that would take about ten years, uh, and then start my first experiment. I could otherwise try to do it uh, in my house. And so what you're looking at is a picture from eight years ago in my uh, apartment in Park Slope. This is our living room. Um, we turned the living room table into a lab bench, uh, basically covered it with a tarp. We ordered some basic reagents and some bacteria online. And, uh, and we did our first experiment. The first experiment that we did as GenSpace was genetically engineer an E. coli bacteria to glow green. So we inserted a green, it's called a green fluorescent protein uh, gene from a jellyfish into the E. coli and uh, grew the E. coli up. Surprisingly, we didn't have an incubator. Uh, so what we had to do, and we will never do this again, is we took the Petri dish of the uh, engineered E. coli and someone taped it under their armpit <laughs> slept overnight with this E. coli under their armpit, and voila, we actually got genetic engineering to work in a, in a living room in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> of course, a brilliant start to a brilliant career, right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it proved to us that we could do biotech in an unconventional setting, outside of your, uh, your, your corporate lab or your industrial lab, and certainly outside of your academic lab. And it meant to us that uh, 
biotechnology, the, the barriers to biotechnology were, were, were lowering and that we might be able to actually do real science in a really unconventional way. Uh, so people started meeting in my house uh, once every other week to try other experiments and very quickly we learned that my roommates weren't going to like that and that there's only so much you can do uh, in, that, um, in, in, in three hours every other week. And so we moved eventually, uh, after a year of hunting, we moved to a place uh, on 33 Flatbush in Brooklyn in a really unconventional art space, uh, and, we, and they allowed us to set up a biology lab. So that's, that's it. And, and what we realized as we went into that um, new facility, if you can even call it that, uh, was that we were joining a much larger movement in biotechnology, which was really about, one, making uh, the technology, making biotech much more powerful uh, in terms of engineering organisms and, and the world and environment and the ecosystems around us, but also making it more ubiquitous. And we were sort of the uh, tip of the spear in making it more ubiquitous, certainly. Um, we started that eight years ago, called it GenSpace. Other people saw that we could do it. Today, there are 95 different groups around the world who are taking biotechnology outside of your traditional labs. Here's our lab. Um, it is very much a platform for the people who come to us. Our, our mission is that anyone can do biotechnology. Uh, given that they have the mentorship and the tools and obviously the safety training to do it. Um, for me personally, when I came here, uh, data and society became kind of a platform for me to, to evaluate what we had been doing for the last eight years, to really think about, well, what, what have we done? How does it fit into society? And what does it actually, what does it actually mean? Um, and, well, I'm going to show you a couple of ways in which we tried to explore that. Uh, so we created something called, oh, it's cut off a little bit, but it's called the Biotech Futures uh, Talk and Lecture uh, Lab Series. And the idea was that we were going to have talks here in Data Society for audiences like you among leaders in, uh, leaders and among people who are really questioning what it means for biotech uh, to infiltrate society in the way it, which it's doing. And so the first uh, talk we did was with he Heather Dewey Hagborg. It was a privacy in the era of personally genomics talk, and I'll, I'll give you a little details on that. The talk was followed up by a lab, actually at our space, uh, in GenSpace, where people who um, learned about what was happening on stage, went actually back to our lab and, and, and tried it for themselves. And so there were a couple of lessons from that. So let, let me just quickly show you who uh, our first speakers were. This is Jason Bob. He's uh, one of the founders of DIYBio.org and also uh, from Mount Sinai. This is Sophie Zier. She's at the New York Genome Center. And here's Heather Dewey Hagborg, who's actually a, a fellow this year as well, and an artist who's been really thinking about the social implications of um, genomics. Um, interestingly, genomics is, is a place where data science and biology really m mesh. The, you know, the soft, wet, gushy stuff, the liquid of, of, of working with vials suddenly matches with uh, the, uh, the actual ones and zeros of, of bio, of, of, uh, of computer science and uh, data analysis. Um, and something that happened when they were doing their workshop, so Sophie and, uh, and Heather did a workshop at, at GenSpace where they were exploring what you can learn from your genome um, simply about your, your history uh, or your, your, your background or, or your parents' background. Um, and there was a really interesting issue that they both were arguing about in front of the students. So here were two, two a scientist and an artist arguing about basically what does it actually mean when you get your genomic data? What does it actually say about your, your background as a human being? Um, the issue was over literally a, a data point that 
pointed to different areas on the map of Europe of where people, where the, where the person's background was from. And if you examine the data in one way, that person was a certain percentage from the UK. And if you analyze that data another way, they were simply from another area in Northern Europe. Um, and so for Heather, that meant that the data was bullshit. I mean, that, that was the language she, she used. And for Sophie, that was, well, this is a, this is, this is the, an error in inter interpretation. And so what I started to understand here was that it was a matter of how you privilege the information, how you privilege what you are receiving. So Heather was privileging uh, personal histories, uh, what you know about your family, uh, and, and Sophie was privileging the data that you find in your DNA. And I don't think they ever reconciled that. Um, here's the second talk. Uh, we were exploring synthetic biology, synthetic biology, programming life with DNA. Um, this was the second one. And synthetic biology is also about the question of how you turn biological wet stuff into, um, how you turn this wet stuff into basically a data science, how you, how you basically program life. And so the two people who are speaking this was amazing, this was, this was foundational for me. These are two of my heroes got to come here and that, I think that I, I owed Data and Society a huge debt for that. Uh, this is Tom Knight, who's basically the pioneer of synthetic biology, and Christina Agapakis, who works with him, who is um, the, one of the first bio designers who's thinking about um, biology as a design medium. Um, and they were talking about the complexity of, of basically programming life. So what does genetic engineering look like when you start to think of uh, genes as individual modules that you can snap together just like programming code? And there were two perspectives there. Tom was trying to simplify things so that literally you could mix and match genes to make your organism do exactly what you want. And Christina Agapakis was saying, well, you know, life is extremely complicated to get organisms to act on these simple, what you're looking as a, at as a circuit, uh, is, is far more complicated. Um, and really what we came to at the end of that conversation was that there's a synthesis of the two, that the only way that biotechnology is going to go forward is where you take the complexity of the, bio, of the biotechnology, you try to apply some of this human engineering to it, and then you sort of mix the two. So you're actually melding uh, evolution, or sort of a directed evolution, and this sort of human engineering. Um, it was, I, I mean, having been here and, and, and exploring it, I think it was really transformative for me. And so uh, again, I'm, I'm thankful to the folks here. Um, going forward, we're gonna do a third one uh, at the, after the end of the summer, where we start to explore how automation fits into this whole uh, world. So uh, stay tuned, there's more to come, um, and I hope I'll see you all there. Thank you very much. Keep. Okay. There we go. All right, hi everybody, I'm Alice Marwick. I've been a fellow here for the last year and I came in uh, planning on working on my next book about privacy. And I ended up spending the year not doing that at all and instead working on a completely different project um, somewhat inspired by the results of the 2016 election. Um, and I've been joined on this by a wonderful team here at DNS and I want to present sort of the top level findings from a very large report that we put out a couple, like about a month ago about media manipulation and disinformation online. So you may remember, or you may not, that in October, sorry, there you go. Um, so you may remember that in October of last year, uh, four Chicago teenagers kidnapped a developmentally disabled man and tortured him on Facebook Live. Um, and it was a really big story for a couple of 
uh, uh, for like a, a week or two. And this is Mike Cernovich. Cernovich is an alt-right media personality, and he has a very large, engaged audience, and he uses emerging technologies to communicate with them. So he used Periscope, which is Twitter's streaming product, to communicate with his audience and figure out how they could use all the publicity around this event to their advantage. So they came up with a particular hashtag, hashtag BLM kidnapping, and decided they were going to try and link the kidnappers with the Black Lives Matter movement, which alt-right is generally not a fan. If they're not really big into racial justice. Um, so here's one of his tweets. If Trump must disavow every random internet troll, then Black Lives Matter must disavow every crime or else they support it. So using an army of coordinated Twitter accounts and bots, uh, Cernovich and his supporters got the hashtag to tweet... Uh, 480,000 times in 24 hours. It trended across the United States and became so prominent that every mainstream media story about the kidnapping after that had to disclaim the fact that the kidnappers were not, in fact, part of Black Lives Matter. Now, why is this important? It's important because Cernovich and his audience know that messaging is reinforced through repetition. They don't care if the mainstream media is disclaiming these stories. They just want them to be repeated. For people like Cernovich and his ilk, who are part of a new populist movement that's very much rooted in white supremacy, misogyny, and anti-Semitism, they know that even if 99 out of 100 people disagree with their message, the mainstream media is able to get that message out to the 1% of people who might agree with them that they can't otherwise reach. So what we've been doing for the last six to eight months is laying out how these far-right subcultures use social media to manipulate the mainstream media into spreading and amplifying their frames for news. So I'm going to show you a diagram that, we, that I've sort of been working on for the last month that is a, how media manipulation works. And it kind of works like a chain. So on the top left-hand corner, you can see spaces that are set up for what we would call far-right organizing. So there's the image boards 4chan and 8chan, which some of you may be familiar with. They're sort of centers of far-right trolling. There's what's called alt-tech, which are alt-right spaces that are set up when the far-right gets kicked off of mainstream spaces. So gab.ai is far-right Twitter. Vote is far-right Reddit. They also have a far-right Wikipedia and a far-right uh, GoFundMe. Um, Discord is a gamer chat space that is very easily, it's like Slack and it's really easy to set up. So they use it to sort of do different campaigns around agile issues. And finally, they have their own blogs and podcasts. So in these organizing spaces, they come up with hashtags, they brainstorm news frames, they think about publicity strategies, and they think about how to recruit places, how to recruit new people. They then use mainstream media, social media sites to get these messages out. So Twitter is the primary one. They use hashtags to try and uh, to try to influence like mainstream media news frames because often journalists source news stories from Twitter. They use Reddit and Facebook groups to get their messages into more mainstream conservative, conservative groups. And they tend to use YouTube to make these like conspiracy theory videos that are about like the real truth about like the Illuminati and the Clintons or whatever. Okay, uh, so I want today really briefly to talk about a few of the tactics and strategies that we've noted that the far right uses. Um, and what's important to understand is that they are aware of a number of vulner vulnerabilities in the mainstream media, a predilection to sensationalism and novelty, a reliance on clickbait and metrics, and a immense amount of time pressure to pump out a lot of stories in a short period of time. So these are all things that the far right uses to their advantage. And I just want to point out that when we use the term far right, we're talking about something different than the alt right. The far right is really a weird amalgam of people like white supremacists, men's rights activists, but also conspiracy theorists and trolls. It's sort of like an unholy alliance of people who come together online to work for different causes and ideologies. So the first thing they use is novelty and sensationalism because the media loves to report on things that are new. And one of the reasons we don't generally use the term alt-right is because the term alt-right itself plays on the media's predilection for novelty. You generally don't see KKK members on the Sunday, you know, the Sunday talk shows, for example. But once Richard Spencer, who's a leader of the alt-right, coined the term, he started popping up on mainstream media sources talking about this new thing called the alt-right. Even though the alt-right's ideas, everything from isolationism to anti-Semitism, are very well-worn, familiar paths in American history. So 
spokespeople like Richard Spencer, they're very telegenic, they're very media friendly, and they do stuff like appear on CNN. So here's the chyron that CNN put after having Richard Spencer on, alt-right founder questions if Jews are people. Not typically something you would see in mainstream media discourse. So their goal here is what they call opening the Overton window. And the Overton window is the range of ideas that are acceptable in mainstream political discourse. And it generally go, kind of goes from like center left to center right. You don't tend to see a lot of like anarchists or lesbian separatists in like mainstream political discourse, but the far right has been able to kind of shift that rightward. Another example is from um, this guy named Weave, Andrew Orenheimer, who's a notorious troll and hacker, and he's also kind of a master media manipulator. And recently he, he did this hack last year where he exploited a security vulnerability in a bunch of internet connected printers that were on main that were on well known college campuses and he sent a bunch of super racist anti semitic flyers to be printed out from these printers now basically probably a couple of hundred people saw it was not actually thousands of printers it was like a couple hundred, probably the, actu the actual impact of people who saw these flyers was a fairly small amount. But because Weave is already a sort of noted media personality and because it had this hook and novelty of like a security flaw in the internet of things, it got picked up and widely spread. So here's a story from Motherboard where it says, the latest exploit of notorious hacker Weave shows just how awful the internet of things can be. And he's really good at the, using this kind of predilection for novelty and sensationalism to spread his message. All right, so the second strategy we've identified is ambiguity. Now, this is Milo Yiannopoulos, you may also have heard of, who is another, was a, until fairly recently, another leader in the alt-right. And Milo is gay and has a Jewish father, and he claims that the alt-right only uses Nazi imagery to be ironic, in much the same way that 80s heavy metal bands use satanic imagery to kind of annoy their elders and you know, provoke conversation. Now this is reinforced by outlets like Breitbart, which are called alt-light, meaning they repeat some of the talking points of the far right, but they don't tend to repeat the more extreme forms of racism or anti-Semitism that you find rife in far right spaces. So there's plenty of people who will claim that the use of racist or sexist or Nazi imagery is just trolling, they're trying to push buttons, but actually this ambiguity works as a cloak for real white supremacists like Weave. And using Nazi symbols, racist words, and spreading racist ideology supports white supremacy regardless if you're doing it ironically or not. And so the ambiguity of the alt-right allows people to disassociate themselves with parts of the movement they find distasteful while still being able to sort of partner with people on causes that they support. Another strategy is participation and collaboration. As we got more into these worlds, we realized that many of the techniques that are used look really familiar to us from other internet spaces. So this is a screenshot from 8chan before the French election. And we had documented, and other people have documented as well, the fact that 8chan was very invested in Marine Le Pen winning the French election. And they tried very hard to spread a variety of anti-Macron messaging across the media landscape. Oh, sorry, wrong clicker again. So here's a here's a here's a one of the um, here's a sentence. Create anti-Macron and pro-Le Pen memes, trying to show how he is actually an establishment plant to the Frenchies who might think he is actually an outsider. Here we will deposit it all and discuss on what best narrative to push forward to the Frenchies. So in places like 8chan, they discuss strategy. They kind of they they even do like A/B testing at times. They'll throw a lot of different things up against the wall and see what sticks. They'll disseminate certain memes to like Reddit and Facebook and Twitter to see what propagates and what doesn't. And in many ways, this is this very much resembles what Henry Jenkins calls participatory or collaborative culture. It allows, it's a pretty low barrier to entry. Like a lot of the images you see in these spaces are like crappy Microsoft paint art. So pretty much anyone can participate. You have to post an image in order to, um, to post on 8chan or 4chan. And there's a lot of different ways that people can participate in the community. So in many ways, it's similar to the dynamics we see on other sites like Wikipedia. It's just they're working towards um, an end that many of us might find distasteful. The last strategy I want to talk about is radicalization. So the alt-right is, as I said before, is sort of focused on getting more people involved in their cause. And a lot of this is because they are ideologically motivated and they believe that the left has won the culture war. 
But the process of radicalization is what they call red-pilling the normies. And red-pilling comes from the matrix. There's a scene where Neo's mentor Morpheus gives him the choice of the red pill and the blue pill. And if he takes the blue pill, he goes back to his cubicle life. And if he takes the red pill, the reality of the matrix is revealed to him. So they say that being red-pilled is when you open your eyes to the reality of, like, the Illuminati controlling the world, or there being intense sexism against men, or there being like white genocide. There's like a whole variety of different things you can be red pilled towards. Um, but the way that people are red pilled in these communities is often through like the norm normative use of racist language or shocking or edgy imagery, and often through memes. So in the same places that you'll see a lot of like really hyper racist memes or very anti-Semitic memes, you'll also see this, which is a pretty mainstream conservative meme. Like it is transphobic and obnoxious, um, but it is much more mild than many of the other things. And so these types of memes sort of function as a gateway into the more extreme ideologies espoused by the far right. Sorry, this is like the sixth time I've done that and gone backwards. So let's look at what type of effects this type of spreading of uh, far right messaging has. Um, the first set of effects we've identified is agenda setting and framing with regard to the mainstream media. Again, it doesn't matter if the media debunks or dismisses these messages. What matters is coverage. The amount of media coverage affects what people think is important. This is called agenda setting. The media doesn't tell people what to think, but it helps guide them as to what to think about. Media manipulators in this way are able to influence the public agenda. They also spread misinformation because their goal is to define and frame a news story from the beginning. Research shows that when people are presented with information that contradicts their pre-existing beliefs, they'll often double down on their original opinions rather than changing them. So genuinely, genuinely correcting misinformation is very difficult once a particular news frame is already out there in the public eye. And an accurate version of events is often less interesting than a sensationalized or simplistic one. So the original framing of the story, the one that's crafted by the media manipulators, is often the one that sticks. We already are at historically low levels of trust in the mainstream media, and unfortunately, this distrust is self-perpetuating. This is partly because groups that are already cynical of the mainstream media, like ideologues or trolls or conspiracy theorists, are often the ones who are drawn to manipulating it. And the more successful they are, the more they believe the media is able to be manipulated and it decreases their trust in the media further. And the impacts of these mistrusts, unfortunately, are quite significant. People are less likely to access accurate information, which has civic ramifications. It increases voting strictly across partisan lines. It weakens citizens' political knowledge, and it decreases the watchdog function of the mainstream media. And finally, we are worried about this increased radicalization because we're seeing these far-right ideologies spread across new spaces, like genre fandom or video gaming, for example. And there's a worrisome rise in violent attacks and extremism from the far-right as a result. So we think that that really needs to be kept an eye on. So in conclusion, social media does enable participation and creativity and organizing, but that's not always done by groups that we might agree with. We can't categorize creative participation as by definition positive. And more, more specifically, we can't let the far right cloak their messaging in this idea of ambiguity or trolling or uh, irony. Instead, we really need to continue to call out sexism and racism and anti-Semitism where we see it, whether it's in person or in our online communities. Um, and I'd like to thank the rest of the team and my co-author, Becca Lewis, for making this report possible and to Data and Society for a great year. Thank you. And so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Rebecca Wexler, who works with the Legal Aid Society to advocate for more lenient criminal discovery laws, draft legal motions to compel disclosure of data and source code for forensic technologies, and build partnerships with technology companies to facilitate a reasoned approach to defendants' request for user information. Thanks, Rebecca. Imagine for a moment that you're a hardworking family guy. You're 30 years old, no trouble with the law. One day in your neighborhood, there's a horrible murder. 
Police find a bandana near the bodies. And even though the local crime lab says that it can't tell whose DNA is on the bandana, a private company runs the evidence through a computer system and says, that DNA is yours. You're charged with the murder and you're facing the death penalty. I bet that you would want to know exactly how that computer system works. And if the guy who built it and is now selling it for millions got up on the witness stand to describe it, you wouldn't trust him. You would want to see it for yourself. At least that's how Michael Robinson felt when all of this happened to him. He tried to subpoena the source code for the computer system so that he could determine whether it works the way its developer claims, without error, bias, or even Volkswagen-style fraud. <laughs> but the developer said that the source code was a trade secret, and refused to hand it over. Mr. Robinson was forced to defend his case without full access to the evidence against him. Our legal system guarantees criminal defendants certain rights. They have a right to confront the evidence against them and to compel evidence in their favor. They have a right to present a defense, which is basically a right to tell their own story about the evidence. It doesn't matter how improbable that story might seem to outsiders. And they have a right to do all of this in a public trial. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. Today, the criminal justice system is becoming automated. At every stage, from policing and investigations to bail, evidence, sentencing, and parole. Computer systems guide outcomes. AI deploys cops on the beat. Audio sensors generate gunshot alerts. Forensic analysts rely on algorithms to match DNA, faces, fingerprints, and more. And risk assessment instruments help to determine who goes to prison, and for how long. Now, just to be clear, <laughs> I'm neither for nor against these technologies. They might be good. They might be bad. I'm here to talk about something else. Ownership. Automation is driving privatization. Just like private prisons that have been found to under-maintain safety and security, or private police who operate with little oversight and training. New criminal justice technologies are primarily privately owned and sold for profit. Trade secrets are the intellectual property protection of choice for the developers of these technologies. And as a result, they often refuse to disclose details about how those tools work. Even to criminal defendants and their attorneys, even under a protective order, even in the controlled context of a courtroom proceeding. Trade secrets are black boxing criminal justice. Sorry, this is, <laughs> stick, pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> um, I work for the Legal Aid Society of New York City, defending criminal cases that involve computer-derived evidence. And I regularly see Defendants denied access to information that they could use to cross-examine the evidence against them because somebody says it's a trade secret. So I'm going to give you three examples. A few weeks ago, uh, this letter appeared on my desk. It's from an inmate at the Eastern Correctional Facility in upstate New York. This man had been in prison for 26 years, and he had a nearly perfect record of rehabilitation. For the past decade, he had not had a single disciplinary infraction. But last summer, he was denied parole. And the board said that the reason was that a computer system called Compass had given him a high score for prison misconduct. Now, something clearly failed <laughs> between zero disciplinary infractions and high score for prison misconduct. But the company that builds Compass considers the weights of its input variables to be trade secrets. So if one of those inputs is wrong, it's impossible to tell how it affects your final score. This man tried to challenge his Compass result. 
but without being able to prove that the final score gave a distorted picture of his life. He couldn't convince anyone to fix it. Here's my second example, ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is an audio surveillance system that's made up of audio sensors placed through a neighborhood that are supposed to send gunshot alerts to police. And for years, the company that sells ShotSpotter has told anyone who will listen, including police procurement committees, that human voices do not trigger ShotSpotter sensors. Apparently, what they meant to say was that the sensors record everything 24 hours a day and store those recordings for up to three days. Or at least <laughs> that's what one of their engineers told a court in Massachusetts after ShotSpotter recordings of human voices were introduced into evidence in a criminal case. Recording voice communications might violate constitutional privacy protections or wiretapping laws. But when defense attorneys have tried to subpoena information about how the sensors distinguish voice communications from ambient sound, they got this response. The company considers that information to be a trade secret. All right, for my third example, remember Michael Robinson. The um, company that built the DNA analysis software program used in his case, the program's called True Allele, in case you want to look it up. The developer of that program has submitted affidavits to courts across the country, saying that if he were forced to disclose the code for that program to defense attorneys under a protective order, it would be, quote, financially devastating for his company because it would allow competitors to steal his product. <sighs> Judges are falling in line with that view. In 2015, a California appeals court case applied a trade secrets evidentiary privilege to a criminal proceeding for what I believe is the first time in the nation's history in order to shield true allele source code from the defense. That case is now being cited in courts across the country. I've seen it in filings in New York to justify withholding trade secret evidence from criminal defendants. And let's be clear, the defense attorneys in these cases have agreed to sign protective orders. One recently told a court, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I've never violated a protective order. It didn't make a difference. The judge refused to order the code disclosed. Importing a trade secrets evidentiary privilege into criminal proceedings is harmful. In civil cases, it's risky to assert the privilege because a well-resourced adversary might challenge the validity of your trade secret and blow up all its value. But most criminal defendants don't have the resources to engage in that kind of complex IP litigation. And so it's easy for people to abuse the system by claiming protections for information when no valid trade secret exists. In fact, that's already happening right here in New York City. For years, the office of the chief medical examiner has refused to disclose source code in a software program that it developed in-house using taxpayer funds. It says, the code is a copyrighted and proprietary asset that belongs exclusively to the city of New York. And that its ownership interest is one reason it doesn't have to share the code. Now, this is ludicrous, right? A public lab has no legitimate commercial interest in withholding information from the accused. And last summer, a judge on the Southern District of New York called their bluff. She said, hand it over. An expert reviewing the code promptly found an undisclosed function that was likely to aid prosecutors. This is also new. Property rights do not generally let you withhold evidence from a criminal court. You can't decide you're not going to hand over your office stapler or your favorite t-shirt because you'd rather keep using it. Um, and it didn't used to be clear that you could even withhold trade secrets in a civil proceeding. Back in the day, there was a big fight between these two famous legal thinkers, John Henry Wigmore and Judge Learned Hand. Wigmore wanted to privilege trade secrets, Hand did not. They fought about it for about a quarter century until on the eve of Pearl Harbor, 
Wigmore accused his opponents of underappreciating United States military industry, like aircraft or chemical factories, and he won the debate. Even so, I have found no indication that anyone ever even considered applying that privilege in a criminal proceeding until the late 20th century, and no indication that anyone ever did until 2015. It's not how trade secrets law is supposed to work either. Intellectual property exists because we think that people will be more likely to invest in new ideas if they can stop their business competitors from free riding on the results. Think about this with me for a minute. If the law is designed to stop business competitors from stealing information, we apply that law to shield information from defense attorneys. What does that say about defense attorneys? Here are some of my colleagues at the Legal Aid Society. What does that say about them? Um, Michael Robinson was lucky. Last spring, a jury found him not guilty, went home to his family. Other defendants will not be so fortunate. How many innocent defendants will be wrongfully convicted based on trade secret evidence that they couldn't fully cross-examine? Right now, the United States Supreme Court is considering review in a case that raises a similar issue, Wisconsin versus Loomis. The defendant in that case is arguing that due process bars the government from sentencing somebody based on a trade secret tool. If the court declines review, or if it rules the wrong way, legislatures should step into the gap and pass laws that restrict safeguards for trade secrets evidence in criminal proceedings to a protective order and nothing more. If evidence is used against you, you should have a right to see and contest it. Thank you. Can I invite all three of you back up? I'm gonna give this. So now's the fun time where we get to turn it over to questions. As you can see, one of the things that's really fun about the way that data bytes work is that we have all sorts of interesting intellectual meaty juicy topics to grapple with. So all of you have just been whiplashed through three awesome kinds of conversations that we have here in DNS. So who now has questions? Hi. Um these are all pretty remarkable presentations, but I have a spe some specific questions for Rebecca. Um, uh, so um, I'm curious about what your opinion is about the path forward um, with this problem. Um, I, I hear you uh, about the legislation, which I think that seems like that could be promising. It seems to me that um, from, from what I know that um, basically, law practiced in the criminal courts in this country is practiced at a very low level. Um, <laughs> that uh, it, it, there's just sort of a, like, not a lot of skill involved, and the judges are often quite incompetent um, and prejudiced in various ways. And so um, I'm thinking about um, how one might educate judges um, as a really, really important part of this. Um, that it almost doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, but you have judges that have absolutely no idea how any of this works and just get snowed by it. So I wonder what you think about, you know, again, what are the possibilities for actually making change? I, mean, I agree with your analysis, unfortunately, that in, especially in state courts, um, there's just such a volume of cases and that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that goes through or nobody really knows the, the deeper issues. I do think that a, a law that tells judges that they cannot order a non-disclosure remedy in a criminal proceeding would be useful, could be pretty clear cut. Um, so I think that, but other ways to, to educate judges, um, you know, I think part of it might be educating defense attorneys. And these are people that are also incredibly skilled and very overworked. 
Uh, but if more defense attorneys were to challenge the validity of these assertions of privilege, it, it might also help. Thanks. Other folks. Come on now. Thank you. So I'm, I'm used to be a lawyer, so I still have that competitive little bitch side of me. Great. So I think for the last two talks, one of the things that struck me is couldn't, I mean, if you could organize people, I like to see technology beat back problems instead of having to turn to the legislature. So couldn't you organize people to create something that's competitive with the proprietary stuff and open source it and just undercut, you know, the proprietary players? I mean, have you talked about that? So some of the, so some companies are actually in the market, for-profit companies that are far more transparent than the horror story examples that I provided. And True Allele, which is the one that I, I'm most worried about, is making these waves of bad law across the country. One of their main market competitors is a company called Starmix that actually has adopted a voluntary defense access policy. They say, no problem, take our code. There might be leaks. We're going to just deal with that. We are committed to meaningful defense access. Um, this is a question for, hi, sorry. This is a question for Rebecca, but I also have a question for Daniel, if no one else has a question. <laughs> um, uh, so what are the stated official reasons why courts adopt these technologies? And what are the metrics that the companies and the courts use to justify their use? Huh. Um, also great question. So. You know, in New York, there is a forensic oversight committee that does review some of these technologies, and they uh, they did approve the use of True Allele, the DNA technology, and uh, there are also thresholds to admitting evidence based on these technologies in court. So a judge will apply what's called either Daubert or Fry. It's a standard for how reliable some type of expert opinion evidence is before it comes into a jury. Part of the problem, though, <laughs> is that those decisions really are independent of defendants' constitutional rights. So you still, after admissibility, have a confrontation right to challenge and cross-examine information. And in fact, the standards for admitting evidence are a little bit lenient because there's an expectation that the evidence will be challenged after it's admitted. So these oversight, uh, oversight structures are inadequate. I would argue anyway. Are we, okay, questions now for, for Alice or Dan? We're not gonna get, all right, there we go. It's the mean thing of, of always giving the last, I know I did, I did typecast you as a lawyer. It's very cruel that way. So uh, this is a question for Alice. Um, and yeah, I'm a lawyer, so immediately um, my response is, first of all, oh crap. Second, what now? Um, like, what do we do about it? Um. That's a really good question. So there's a lot of solutions that are, have been proposed in public. Uh, one of them is the sort of discussion around fake news that you know, things should be labeled as fake news and people on Facebook should get a little alert if they try to solve, if they try to share a piece of fake news. And obviously I think the dynamics that we're demonstrating here show that that's not a sufficient solution. And the same with media literacy. I mean, not only do we have these bad actors who are trying to manipulate the media for their own good, we have this hyper-partisan far-right press um, that is motivated both ideologically and financially to produce large volumes of low quality content that is not just partisan, but propagandistic in the way that it mixes falsehoods and half-truths. Um, I think one of the things that we are thinking about is, first of all, how can we understand this as a set of processes that need to be deconstructed and uh, we need to know more about this before we can propose these solutions so that we don't propose solutions that do more harm than good. Like, what does it mean to be part of these communities where these are the types of news messages that you're taking in and believing as true, right? Um, who are the people on these far right sites and like, what are they doing? Like, what are they motivated by? What, like, 
why are they in, like engaged in this type of processes? Um, can we look at models from the past of propaganda or of different types of disinformation to learn? And so those are all projects that other team members are doing. So we're hoping at DNS that we end up generating kind of like a body of knowledge around this that goes takes the, this report as like a starting point and builds on it. Um, I also think that there is a lesson for journalists here, and I think that that's a very difficult thing because if you are looking at a rumor that's spread through the right wing press and you're a mainstream media outlet and you don't cover it, even if just to debunk it, you're often accused yourself of being fake news or of being partisan or of being biased. Um, but, you know, there are models for this. Like, journalists don't generally cover, like, suicides, for example, right? Because they're, it's seen as possibly promoting a copycat. So there are situations in which I think there could be professional guidelines of how to cover some of these types of things that might allow us to sort of sidestep how these messages get into the more mainstream media. But it's, you know, it's a complex problem, so it's not going to be solved with one thing. It's going to have to, it's going to require a constellation of solutions. So, Alice, um, I wondered if you've taken your model, the, the strategy, your sort of tiered model there, have you looked to see if the same things apply on the far left, just less successfully? Um, that is a great question, and that's the number one piece of feedback we've gotten from this report is are we being, are we biased? I mean, obviously we have a certain bias, those of us on the team, but I think that, well, first of all, we have someone on the team who's working on, like, is there an alt-left right now? And that's sort of an essay that she's in progress of working on. Um, but I think that what we have seen so far is that even though you certainly have fringe groups on both the left and the right, the left tends to be less well-organized. And they're not as good at promoting their message into the mainstream. Like, if you look at, like, what is the far-left equivalent of this? The far-right thinks their far-left equivalent is anti-fascist groups. And like anarchists. That's, that's who they think their far left equivalent is. Um, but we also could think of our far left equivalent as being people who are spreading a lot of conspiracy theories about Trump rather than conspiracy theories about Clinton, right? Um, so we are not seeing evidence of the same kind of targeted coordination on the left that we've seen on the right, but that's certainly a piece of the puzzle that we're currently unpacking. So Dan, you've just heard two folks who are uh, basically giving you really horrifying portraits of manipulation of systems. Um, and you're in the middle of a field that like, there's so much enthusiasm, so much optimism for, such that 10 years from now, we're going to be sitting here going, and they manipulated it this way. What do you see are some of the biggest risks um, as you're looking forward to some of the genetic and, and genome-related contexts, um, spaces where we can actually get ahead of it and maybe prevent some hardcore manipulation? Um, just so I understand, are, what kind of manipulation are we talking about? Are we manipulating DNA or are we manipulating public opinion? Things that can go terribly wrong. Oh, Lord. But I mean, how do we get ahead of it? I mean, basically, I'm, I, I know Ingrid's somewhere around here. She can give you a lot of terrible imaginations. I'm confident of that. I'm more, I'm more thinking so about how can we prevent it. I've been spending a lot of time on this question um, outside of the DNS context. Uh, the, the, so I, as I showed, there were 95 different groups that when I last checked, all of them are contending with the issue of, number one, public perception. Are people looking at these groups as potential bioterrorists? Are they seeing them as education centers? And I would like to say that they are mainly, they are, uh, as far as I know, education centers. Um, and then how do you mitigate risk going forward as this technology uh, spreads across the population? Um, you know, so I have a couple of answers to that. One, at the level of sophistication, that I'm seeing in the DIY, it's called DIY bio, uh, do-it-yourself biology. That's, the, that's sort of one of the names for this community. It doesn't look like they are doing sophisticated enough research to be a threat on the level that, you're that you might be describing. So if you remember the, the anthrax attacks, uh, at, at least from what the reports said, and then it's still unclear, that was, a, that was a strain that came out of the US Army. Uh, certainly not out of some uh, homebrew lab. 
so there's that. And then there's the other thing that we're working on, which is organizing ourselves. And so we spend a lot of time working hand in hand with law enforcement, uh, and particularly the FBI, in figuring out how do we how do we make sure that our communities are behaving responsibly? Uh, and so uh, those conversations continue. I think that as time goes on and as the technology becomes more powerful and also more accessible, uh, we'll see that that dialogue spreads beyond just these kind of initial conversations with the FBI, but with, in conversations across the policy world. So it's, a, it's, it's actually a, a conversation that's happening already um, but I don't think that we have gotten to the point yet where there needs to be some sort of added regulation or added uh, stringency on, on what's going on in that world. Great, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So, so uh, th this is sort of a, a multi-part question for uh, everyone all together. Um, do you see any analogs between the way that image manipulation and mass communication technology has developed and the way that genetic manip manipulation technology could develop? And you, th like you mentioned the FBI just now and the potential for FBI regulation as sort of a solution to anything malignant. Um, I guess, how, how do we protect individual privacy while also protecting the you know, the mass security that you, you need to maintain when you give people these potentially dangerous tools. Um, and I, that pertains to the, the courtroom as well. Uh, you know, when does the government become able to abuse the, um, the, the protections that, you know, like, are there any cases of, like, for example, the FBI and Apple, um, how does trade secret protection interact with that? So, so let, let me let me counterpoint. I I could not have started the lab that we started had there not been a, a, a way for me to communicate with mass amounts of people across the city and probably across the world. Uh, I I think the the science itself as well. It would not we would not be able to do what we do if the science were not accessible through digital media. So um, I think. We should take this in balance, and I'll, I'll just I'll pass it on. So, with the FBI and, and Apple, the government was trying to compel a company to do something for it. Um, I, one of the concerns that I have about the trade secrets privilege is that it's actually going to be disproportionately affecting defendants. So the government is going to be able to select which tools it uses and introduces. It's not going to be a situation where it's trying desperately to get this information most of the time. Uh, and so it will have an incentive to actually have plausible deniability. It won't want to know details about the methodology that might uh, be able to poke holes in the results if it is in turn trying to rely on those results to convict somebody. So there's going to be an asymmetrical interest in having transparency in that particular context. It's a sort of opposite of, of, of Apple. So um, do you think at some point we can fix that um, by seeing DIY bio companies fill in that space and basically have dueling theories. You've got Truly on the prosecution side and then some shop on the, the defense side. They have different results on the DNA. Then in some ways you either are going to have to evaluate the source code or they cancel each other out, right? Are we going into business together? Uh, absolutely. I mean, so this is this is obvious. I think there will be a point very soon where being able to read DNA will be something that anyone can do. I think high school will be able to do it. Uh, we're certainly teaching it in our lab where you literally will take your own cheek swab and you could submit it and get back your DNA results and you'll get your A's, T's, C's, and G's and, and, a, and an order and you'll be able to tell something about yourself. I imagine, and I, actually I don't have to imagine, I've seen it, Heather Dewey Hagborg yet again, uh, went out on the street as part of her project with us, collected 
gum and cigarette butts and all this, uh, you know, basically human detritus and basically pulled the, the DNA out of these things and was actually able to get long reads of the person who left that behind. So if Heather can do it, I don't see why, uh, you know, there might be a, a DIY uh, service that would, would counter uh, this uh, allele company. Sadly, we are out of time, but I know a lot of you have more questions for folks. But first, a round of applause of thank you for the fantastic presentation.